Welcome to an NTC webinar series. Today we will be presenting an introduction to NFPA 70E, Standard for Electrical Safety in the Workplace. NFPA 70E is revised, reviewed, and reissued every three years. 2015 is the latest edition. Additionally, each revision of NFPA 70E incorporates the most recent edition of NFPA 70, National Electrical Code. We will have a Q&A session at several intervals throughout the presentation. All attendees will be muted. Questions can be posed in chat at any time. We'll pause from time to time to answer questions. Electrical accidents are typically caused by one or a combination of three possible factors. Work involving unsafe equipment and installations, workplaces made unsafe by the environment, and unsafe work performance, known as unsafe acts. The first two factors are sometimes considered together and simply referred to as unsafe conditions. Thus, electrical accidents can generally be considered as being caused by unsafe conditions, unsafe acts, or in what is usually the case, a combination of the two. It should also be noted that inadequate maintenance can cause equipment or installations that were originally considered safe to deteriorate, resulting in an unsafe condition. <clears throat> Subpart S of OSHA 29 CFR 1910 addresses electrical safety requirements that are necessary for the practical safeguarding of employees in their workplaces. Sections 1910.331 through 1910.335 are regulations associated with safety-related work practices. The provisions of 1910.331 through 1910.335 cover electrical safety-related work practices for both qualified persons, that is, those who have training in avoiding the electrical hazards working on or near exposed energized parts, and unqualified persons. Those with little or no such training, working on, near, or with the various installations listed in 1910.331. Subpart R covers special industries. Specifically, our interest here is in 1910.269, which covers electric power generation, transmission, and distribution. This section covers the operation and maintenance of electric power generation, control, transformation, transmission, and distribution lines and equipment. These provisions apply to basically everything associated directly or indirectly with generation, transmission, and distribution of electricity. 1926 subpart K introduction states that safety related work practices are contained in 1926.416 and 417. In addition to covering the hazards arising from the use of electricity at job sites, these regulations also cover the hazards arising from the accidental contact, direct or indirect, by employees with all energized lines above or below ground, passing through or near the job site. 1926 subpart V, or Victor, introduction states that except for paragraph A3 of this section, this subpart covers the construction of electric power transmission and distribution lines and equipment. As used in this subpart, the term construction includes the erection of new electric transmission and distribution lines and equipment and the alteration, conversion, and improvement of existing electric transmission and distribution lines and equipment. Paragraph A3 mentioned here refers to the power generation section previously mentioned from 1910.269. So who really needs the electrical training? OSHA states that employees which fall into the following occupations shown here shall be trained if their work or the work of those they supervise brings them or the employees they supervise close enough to expose parts of electric circuits operating at 50 volts or more to ground for a hazard to exist. The training must include all of the requirements of subpart S 1910.331 through .335, which is basically everything. Any questions? As we move on, how does OSHA and NFPA 70E interact with each other? Well, on October 18, 2006, OSHA replied to a question 
that was posed to them. The question was, has OSHA promulgated or changed any standards to directly incorporate an FPA 70E 2000 at this time? The following is OSHA's response. No, the electric installation requirements and the electric safety related work practices in OSHA's general industry standards in subpart S, electrical work, are based on previous editions of 70E. However, OSHA has proposed to update the installation requirements in subpart S based on part one of the 2000 edition of NFPA 70E. Later stages of this rulemaking project will also be based on other parts of NFPA 70E. Also, it should be noted that the latest edition of NFPA 7 standard is NFPA 70E 2004. This response can be found in the 69 Federal Register 17773 dated April 5, 2004. The reason why OSHA pointed out that the current standard was 2004 when this question was posed based on 2000 edition is that OSHA, even though they may not have incorporated the most recent 70E, they consider the most recent 70E a consensus standard which must be weighed and considered in all things that we do, as you will see later. Because OSHA is not adopted through rulemaking the requirements of a more recent edition of 70E, those requirements have not become OSHA standards. However, a national consensus standard can sometimes be relevant to a general duty clause citation in the sense that the consensus standard may be used as evidence of a hazard recognition and the availability of feasible means of abatement. The general duty clause, section 5 sub A1 of the OSHA Act is violated if an employer has failed to furnish a workplace that is free from recognized hazards causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. The general duty clause is used where there is no standard that applies to the particular hazards involved. In a recent OSHA document, Federal Registry, April 11th, more recently of 2014, Volume 79, Number 70, Final Rule on Electrical Power Generation, Transmission, and Distribution Electrical Protective Equipment. In this final rule, which is 429 pages long, OSHA states that they last issued rules for the construction of transmission and distribution installations in 1972. Those provisions are now out of date and inconsistent with more recently promulgated general industry standard covering the operation and maintenance of electrical power generation, transmission, and distribution lines and equipment. OSHA is revising the construction standard to make it more consistent with the general industry standard and is making some revisions to both the construction and general industry requirements. In this final rule, dated April 11, 2014, NFPA 70E was cited 149 times in the 429-page document. It is crystal clear that OSHA leans heavily on and incorporates NFPA 70E in the electrical safety requirements of the Department of Labor. OSHA continues to adopt the NFPA 70E, but usually lags a few years. NFPA 70E, Article 105.3, and this is the 2015 version, the employer states that the employer shall provide the safety-related work practices and shall train the employee, who shall then implement these practices. Article 110.1A out of 70E 2015 states the employer shall implement and document an overall electrical safety program that directs activity appropriate to the risk associated with electrical hazards. And in 110.1B of 70E, we have the electrical safety program shall include elements that consider condition of maintenance of electrical equipment and systems. Now this is new. In 2015, Throughout the 70E 2015 edition, maintenance is now a major factor that must be considered as part of the electrical safety of the equipment. Along with other parts of 70E, the condition of electrical equipment is now considered to determine unsafe conditions. Run to failure may be a maintenance philosophy, but that philosophy is now rendered practically unacceptable by these changes in NFPA 70E. In NFPA 70E 2015, Article 130.5, it states, an arc flash risk assessment shall be performed and shall, one, 
determine if an arc flash hazard exists. If an arc flash hazard exists, the risk assessment shall determine A, appropriate safety related work practices, B, the arc flash boundary, and C, the PPE to be used within the arc flash boundary. It further states <clears throat> that an arc flash risk assessment shall be performed and shall be updated when a major modification or renovation takes place. It shall be reviewed periodically at intervals not to exceed five years to account for changes in the electrical distribution system that could affect the results of an arc flash risk assessment. And finally, an arc flash risk assessment shall be performed and shall take into consideration the design of the overcurrent protective devices and its opening time, including its condition of maintenance. Maintenance is no longer the maintenance of electrical equipment, both the equipment itself, the devices that protect it. Maintenance is no longer an option. Maintenance is required in order to ensure the equipment is maintained in a safe condition. Electrical equipment shall be maintained in accordance with manufacturer's instructions or industry consensus standards to reduce the risk associated with failure. The equipment owner or the owner's designated representative shall be responsible for maintenance of electrical equipment and documentation. This comes from Article 205.3 of NFPA 70E. So what does it mean, I have a question, what does it mean by a consensus standard? A consensus standard is what NFPA 70E itself is. 70E, 70, IEEE, American National Standards Institute, documents such as the NEDA acceptance testing specifications, the NEDA maintenance testing specifications. These are all consensus standards. They are developed by a group, not a single individual, they are reviewed and vetted by a group, not a single individual. They go through a public review period, not a single individual, and they are then considered a consensus standard and accepted practice. So what this article says that electrical equipment shall be maintained in accordance with both or with the course of manufacturer's instructions or industry consensus standards. And this is a requirement, not a suggestion. So what we have is OSHA requires employers and owners to keep their employees safe from electrical hazards. OSHA adopts and incorporates NFPA 7DE into its regulations. The practices, engineering studies, and protective equipment discussed in NFPA 7DE is not only integral to the Department of Labor regulations, but is a moral obligation we all have to keep ourselves and each other safe. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your attention. May everybody have a safe day and a safe week ahead of them. Thank you.